Kayachtin. I welcome each and every one of you to the gathering today. And I am Sequalia, aka Ann Wanick. I'm a knowledge carrier and elder from the Squamish Nation. And I'd um, like to welcome you to our gathering, grounding our resilience through indigenous approaches to wellness teachings on cedar as a sacred medicine and i'd also like to say kayachtin to our unceded coast salish territories of the skohomashokamayok squamish nation slaywatooth and musqueam for those of you that are on the lower mainland and for all of you who are being zoomed in virtually to our territory. I welcome you. I'd like to just share that um, for a lot of us as Indigenous people, our spirituality is our way of life and that we were a lot of us taught by our grandparents and we carry that um, responsibility and obligation to carry on the teachings that they shared with us because we don't own it. And then they didn't own it. And it just keeps going through as part of the legacy of the footsteps that we walk in. And so my grandfather, as part of my welcome to you, I'd like to say that we need to, in Squamish, we say, in Chomo and Shkwawin. In Hamalkamail, and we say, Natsamat and Shkwawin. One heart and one mind this afternoon. And to be able to, and as uh, my grand, late grandfather Sequam taught me, to change and stwite, stand and work together to hold each other up, support one another, help each other with what we're going to be sharing today, with our transfer of knowledge and with what we take away in our hearts and minds. So, you know, that's what the old people said as I was sharing with the SFU Indigenous Student Center just an hour ago, that we never stop learning until we leave this earth. And so today is a time for us to have that sharing and maybe learn some things from each other that we hadn't thought about before. And my um, grandfather, Sequalton, Dominic Charlie, his father was Shinaltzit. The priest named him Jericho Charlie, and he lived at Iamok, which after they created the Indian reserves, moved him off of his um, longhouse site, was named Jericho Beach after him. So we have strong ties, and my grandson, who I just sent off to school at our nation, Aslahan Learning Center, is Shinaltzit. So we always have a Chenaltzik and a Sequalton, and he also carries the name Sequalton, holding it for his brother cousin. So we always remember those things. And my Sequalton shared with me, we all pray to a higher power. That higher power is known by many names all over the world. And we all pray to that higher power and we we have to winoxus respect each other's ways. So I'm going to ask you all to um, respect our each other's ways today. And then I'll start us by sharing um, a part of Sequalia Slolam Hosqual, part of my ancestor who I'm named after, her song, Great greeting of the day. And then I'll say a prayer, then turn you back over to all your presenters. And um, my grandfather shared that when we um, do share um, prayers and we're asking creator and ancestors to join us, that we shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't be like this or this. We should be open and feeling the energy from creator and ancestors and each other. Even though we're gathering virtually, I say to everyone, we can still feel each other's energy. I usually tease people and say, let's do some yoga and Tai Chi breathing and just breathe in a couple times. And get grounded 
and feel the energy from creator, ancestors, and each other. And while I sing, I ask you to pray for your friends and family. Because another thing our old people taught me is you don't pray for yourself because someone's praying for you. So pray for your family and friends. Asking you, Creator, and Tanoya up and in Sequedo, so yo yo kwa ancestors of everyone gathered here today. Please watch over and guide and protect all of your children gathered here today. Let today's work, Creator, go yet one halt, say top, be excellent work, and let everyone snatch them. Words be heard and take into your heart what's meant for you. Set aside what you don't need today. Maybe bring it back another day and be able to keep it there and be able to speak those words in a good way and maybe transfer what you hear today to others on what this legend that's being created today with our gathering to others that you may feel need to hear what you resonates with you. So help them creator to do that and to help us move through in a smooth, the way and I ask you creator also to put your hand and watch over and help each and every one of the presenters today with the say top the work that they need to do and the words they need to share and to uh, carry them so we do this in a good way Tama Quitsi Snechem those are my words Chen Quen Mentomi I'm grateful and thankful to each and every one of you for letting me help start the day and share the time with you and ground us. Thank you so much for setting us up in a good way and also for modeling the exact thing we're trying to do in this session is to remind us how to create space for being present and connected to our land, to our ancestors, to the work we're doing and to each other, to support each other in this way. Um, it is so important. This, this session is for people who are working in, in disaster-related fields, fields that you're dealing with natural hazards, that it is a very stressful and challenging role to play, to stare down the eventuality of a difficult moment um, because of natural disasters and human-made climate change, or for just preparing for it. There's a lot of weight that practitioners and planners and researchers carry. And our hope so much is that Sequalia's present um, uh, offering of helping us get centered and focused on what we're doing and that the sessions coming up afterwards will help all of us do this work in a way that we are truly more grounded. So thank you. My name is Susanna Haslines and I'm uh, grateful to be coming here today on the traditional and unceded territories of, of the Samyamu, the Katsi, um, and uh, Kwantlen people. And um, I'm grateful for this because as I had mentioned this morning to be reminded of the nations that I am in community with and knowing that truly building resilience for natural hazards is a community wide effort. We do that in relationship with one another. And we also do that building on the knowledge of the peoples that have been here since time immemorial and the, and the stories and the wisdom and the laws that come from this place that we can build our um, understanding risk is the host of today's session and um, understanding risk is a 
This is our third time doing the symposium, but our first time doing it online. So thank you all for joining in on this experiment as we figure out how to do the work. Our session today is about grounding our resilience through Indigenous approaches to wellness. <clears throat> and uh, this is intended to be a, an opportunity to connect science, policy, and action in a way that really thinks about how do we build our resilience in a multifaceted way. I want to offer thanks to our sponsors of Understanding Risk 2020, Natural Resources Canada, the Canadian Safety and Security Program, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, the Office of Housing and Construction Standards, BGC, EERI, the Earthquake Engineering uh, Institute of British Columbia, the BC Real Estate Association, and the Engineers and Geoscientists of BC. Thank you for making this possible and thank you for helping to make this session free for whomever wanted to come. The work um, of this, this symposium is really thinking about how do we implement the Sendai framework in BC. And so you can see on the left hand side, the Sendai, Sendai framework is about trying to reduce mortality, reduce the number of people affected, reduce economic losses, reduce disaster damage, increase uh, disaster risk reduction strategies around the world. Um, and enhanced cooperation, particularly thinking about countries that are still developing um, their economies and um, to increase the availability and access to multi-hazard early warning systems. So that's Sendai. And we think about if that's the international approach here in BC, um, uh, we are working to le learn to understand, understand the risk. And all of the sessions of Understanding Risk BC, our symposium, work to move the dial on Sendai. So first, there are sessions that are looking about understanding the risk. We have sessions that are focusing on the consequences of disaster risk reduction, our choices and our approaches. Um, and we have sessions thinking about governance, about how do we cooperate and collaborate at local and regional scales, ensuring that there is alignment. And we have a variety of sessions. We had sessions all through the fall, and then here's our sessions for November where we are um, working to implement components of these. So um, today, the session is about grounding our resilience. And Emily, I'd like to pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, so Qualia, thank you so much for opening the session for us today. Um, you ground our work in such a beautiful way. And I'm so thankful um, that I've been able to um, ground a lot of my work through the presence that you bring to our space at FNHA. So thank you so much for joining me today. When I was asked to convene this session at the beginning of the summer, I had an entirely different vision for what the session would look like. I thought about how I would bring um, my emergency management uh, practitioner friends who work in First Nations emergency management to share their gifts through the session. And as we went through the summer, I started to realize how fatiguing COVID response was and the wellness toll that that was taking on me um, and, and, and what that impact on fatigue uh, was looking like for my colleagues and for the people in my community, both professionally and personally. And it really made me think about how I could see this time together as a gift um, to really share the lessons that I've learned from my time at FNHA back with my field of practice and those that wanted to join us today. And so remarkably, there's been a shift for me in terms of my professional space of practice moving to FNHA. As a practitioner of, of emergency management, my shift over to FNHA has really been grounded in a space of wellness and a space of culture. And it's really allowed me to think about what my own personal and professional space looks like um, by embracing that and actually having wellness, both spiritual, cultural, and physical wellness as a part of how I move through my work professionally. And it's been a noticeable shift for me in terms of how I recover personally through really adverse events and circumstances in my day-to-day -day work, as well as in my professional space. So as opposed to having another technical discussion on First Nations emergency management or how we build resilience, what I thought I would do with this time was share the gifts of how resilience can be grounded through a space of wellness. And um, I'm about to share a panel and introduce a panel of people that have actually had a profound impact on me over the, over the last year and a half of my time with FNHA. 
Um, and what I've seen is all of these people have wrapped around me in terms of a practitioner and they may not know how much they've wrapped around me. I'm looking at Janine's smile and um, but it's all about bringing these elements of the physical, emotional, spiritual and cultural spaces that have allowed me to ground my space and kind of do the day to day grind of the spaces of crisis response or emergency management that can really be wearing down. So my hope is that you're all able to walk away from today's session with some gifts and some spaces of wellness and actually hold yourself up and allow everybody on the panel to wrap around you today. So that's my hope for our time together. Just a quick overview of what we'll go through is I'm going to um, turn the tables over to Stephanie Papik and she's going to really guide us through a space of how we can translate um, culture into spaces of action and really create strategies for implementation in our fields of practice. I'm then going to turn the tables over to Janine Erickson and she's actually going to bring us into the space of physical wellness and how we bring movement to our life and how we look at health and wellness as a shared and combined space. Um, we're then really grateful to have Sultan Lalem with us today. Um, New Chalnath healer uh, Levi Martin, as well as Jody August, who will actually be able to lead us from a space of cultural and spiritual wellness and ground us in that space in a good way. And then we'll wrap the session up and Sequalia will do the good work and close us in a good way for today. So without any further ado, what I'm going to do is turn it over to Stephanie Papik now to start us off. So thank you, everyone. And I look forward to seeing the session unfold. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to center our learning and integrating wellness through cultural practice and at the same time reducing risk. I am a nook on my father's side from the Northwest Territories in Northern Alaska. And on my mother's side, I'm Irish ancestry with a little bit of Spanish. I guess there was a shipwreck back in the day. And I've been a visitor to Lekwungen Territories for the majority of my life. I'm also a mama, a mother of 21 year old and a 19 year old. And I've been with the province of BC for the last 15 years. So next slide, please. I'm calling in from Husekum, which translates to place of clay, also known as James Bay here in the Kwangan territory. And deep gratitude to Songhees and Esquimalt nations for sharing their knowledge and their teachings that have sustained these lands for thousands of generations. I'd also like to welcome and acknowledge each of you for making the time, being curious and showing up today. And if you'd like, you're welcome to, in the chat function, write the territory you're on. And if this is a new journey for you, you'll see on my slide, nativeland.ca is the really great website to find out which territories uh, you are residing on. All right, next slide, please. So our intentions is um, so uh, I like to just always ground us in the big picture of the why um, as well build on the existing practices recognizing many of you are already on a, this learning journey and also some of you are new to newer to it uh, and yeah just building on some of those interpersonal skills that we already may have within our practice uh, as well, we're being responsive to community needs and, uh, and in this work, recognizing that this is a journey, we're going to make mistakes along the way and that's how we learn and grow. So the next slide, in terms of the big picture, why should we care about integrating culture into our emergency management services? This work is supported by the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that was passed in December 2019 that um, commits us to aligning our laws, regulations, and policies to be in alignment with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. More broadly across Canada, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, which came out of a class action suit of residential school survivors from across Canada, one of them including being my father. Uh, within more BC in 2018, there was the identified need for an increased cultural competency in emergency responders, 
government representatives and volunteers. Uh, this came from the Chief Marine Chapman and George Abbott report, The New Normal, 21st Century Disaster Management in BC. So really overall, a call for the need to have more compassion in emergency management. And slide, next slide please. So as uh, something I always like to do when I bring people together is to make some time to offer some agreements for how we would like to support each other in, in our time together. And this really aligns with the neuroscience and how our brains work. When we give feedback in a way that is strength-based, it activates the neurons in our prefrontal cortex, puts us in our planning, thinking, compassionate brain, versus when we give feedback in a way that feels threatening, like perhaps, you know, Sally's being called out for being a racist, that activates the neurons in our amygdala. So the behavior response we get is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn and not the desired behavior change that we're hoping for. And so some agreements you'll see I have up here is one, just, yeah, recognizing people already on this path already, and to meet people where they're at on their learning journey, recognizing we're all in different places, stages in, in that learning. Another one is, uh, comes from youth is that belief in the basic goodness of people, belief in, the in good intentions. And my personal favorite is to take what you need, offer what you can. It takes any hierarchy that exists, whether that's gender, color, age, puts it on its side, recognizes shared leadership. And finally, uh, the power of pausing, that's slowing down. Silence, um, pausing to silence. Silence can be a powerful grounding tool. It can be a way to refocus, recenter, as well as honor people for being really honest and authentic with, the, with where they're at. And uh, so I'd like to offer those for our time together. Uh, hopefully those resonate with you. And what I'd like to do is just take a moment to ground ourselves in those agreements. So if you'd like, you could, you're welcome to put both feet on the ground. I know for me, I have to scooch up on my chair a little bit. And then uh, if you like, you could tilt your pelvic bone forward. Imagine a thread tall pulling your head, a little tuck in your chin, and a soft gaze forward. Or if you feel more comfortable, closing your eyes. Starting to bring awareness to your breath. Just noticing your inhale and your exhale. And I'll invite you to clasp your hands together and just rest them on your lap. And bringing awareness to your breath. Letting go of whatever was happening early on or later on today. And just that invitation to be really present in our time together. And with that, opening your eyes. And we'll move to the next slide. So uh, you might look at your hands that are clasped and notice uh, either your right or your left thumb on top. Now I'll just invite you to open your hands and slightly shift them so that now your other thumb and fingers are on top. And notice how, and then close again. Just notice how that feels. Usually people tell me it feels really uncomfortable and awkward, and that's pretty normal. And so sometimes as, as we're doing this work, it's an invitation into practice of two-eyed seeing. So with the one eye, our Western ways of seeing and knowing, and then with our other eye, inviting in that uh, indigenous ways of knowing and seeing. And recognizing sometimes it might feel uncomfortable, it might feel awkward, uh, sometimes even if us uh, might feel an, um, a sense of like around safety and just to know that you're safe and uh, with intentional practice over time, we can create new neural pathways, new habits, new ways, tendencies to being. So I'll move us on to the next slide, please. And just a little brief um, attention to language. Something is so important in this work. Uh, the words we use have the power to lift each other up or to diminish. And uh, one of the ones you'll notice perhaps over time has shifted is uh, we now use indigenous before terms like Aboriginal and native. And it's likely that word will continue to shift just because of the challenge of trying to give one term to um, 
a whole diverse range of nations, uh, not only across BC, across Canada and Inuit, it's inherently awkward to try and find one word to represent such a diverse range of uh, cultures. So it will be something that shifts all the time. I expect. Uh, another one is that movement to strength-based language. Uh, you know, the using the word, choosing the words we use, like if we talk about vulnerable populations, that being an identity for people kind of feels awkward. And also raising our awareness just around that, our comfort around gender and the gender diversity that is being called to, to recognize um, within our society. All right, now on to the next slide, please. So in terms of that practical aspect that Emily was talking about, um, how to create space for relational in meeting agendas. Uh, and one of the key things I've found in that is addressing the dominant narrative that will come up, that there's not enough time to do that. And I've found that uh, if we invest in relationships at the beginning and then when there's uh, something happens like an emergency, it's a lot easier to deal when we have those relationships in the beginning. So there, there is enough time and it's just about making that time for it. And what that could look like in terms of making time, uh, one of them is offering agreements for our time together. So today in the webinar series, I uh, did it more of kind of offering some and, and we can also co-create them in, in different spaces. As well, making time for a check-in and it doesn't have to take a long time, like half an hour and have everyone go into big detail. Uh, it can be really short, it could be one word, it could be three words, and just it's a really nice way for everyone to be able to put their voice into the center of the circle, to be heard, um, and to feel safe. And then there, I find in terms of engagement, uh, more people are likely to engage beyond, say, the, the type, a folk, type A folks that we always can count on hearing from. As well, building in time for discussion rounds so that everybody has that opportunity to give their voice, to share their, their input, rather than uh, just the, the dominant voices that, that tend to have to show up. Um, and one other concrete thing is in work plans. I've added at the beginning of my work plans, the very first thing, relationship tending, and um, thinking about which relationships do we need to be nurturing uh, and how can we make time for that. Awesome, thank you. On to my next slide. Another key piece is, um, is around integration and the power of repetition. And something we learned at EMBC through the COVID response is integrating cultural safety and humility learning segments into our, our week. We have our daily response uh, where we all come together, get on the same page. And so once a week in those half hour daily responses, we had a three to five minute learning session. We developed in partnership with First Nations Health Authority to uh, help bring folks along in learning to understand what does the practice of cultural safety and humility look like in emergency management. Uh, if we asked this question at the beginning, they would have just kind of looked at us blankly. And after the eight weeks period of five minutes a day, after the eight weeks, we asked everyone uh, with the online Mentimeter engagement, what does that practice look like? And this beautiful word cloud appeared before us. So respect, patience, listening, empathy. And so uh, folks were just through that little bit, were able to learn quite a bit over a period of time and it really helps to create a culture shift. Next slide, please. So on to some wise practices. You'll notice today, uh, many of us who have spoken have done an acknowledgement of the territory. Uh, I find sometimes when things get translated into the Western world, they get a bit morphed. So sometimes people think it's like a check mark for the meeting and it's more like something as an individual practice that we do. So it's a suggested wise practice and rather than a best practice and practicing that humility. As well, I found in any meetings where we are meet, meeting with Indigenous nations to acknowledge that we haven't gotten it right in the past and we probably don't likely have it right today. 
and to acknowledge that Indigenous people and nations have been stewards of the lands and waters for thousands of generations. And there's a recent study that shows that lands managed by Indigenous people have the highest biodiversity globally. All right, next slide, thank you. And really what we're experiencing is a culture shift and a groundswell, not only here in BC, across Canada and globally. And really what's happening as I see is this humanizing of our practices and our processes, allowing people to show up as a whole person, moving away from seeing policy as black and white, being more and human, being more human in our approach and meeting people where they're at as well as decentering Western ways of meeting. So like today, using some elements of circle practice and agreements to help create that culture shift, that power of reputation over time. And so important to making time to adjust feelings that arise. This work can bring up a lot of different feelings and, uh, and they can become barriers to inaction. And just that power of acknowledging like, yeah, you know, sometimes it can, learn, as we learn new things about our shared history, it can bring up a lot of different feelings and knowing that whatever feelings they are, that they're real, they're valid, and they're that um, connection to our, our shared humanity. And uh, so that we can, and it's so important that we do address those feelings so that we can, we can step into that courageous space and do or say something. And in that action, recognize that we're going to make mistakes. So humbly fumbling along this path of reconciliation. And lastly, letting go of some of that being driven by government uh, and prioritizing to self-governance honoring the agency of nations who have been governing these lands and waters for thousands of generations. And it's the reason why this country was considered the land of plenty when explorers first came here. The last piece in terms of what we can do on our own personal growth is to seek out opportunities for social emotional learning to help make that journey from our head to our heart and then to learn how to work with the feelings that arise. And some tools in terms of learning more about our blind spots and biases. Real Engine is a documentary that unpacks how the Hollywood uh, and media really shapes the way that we can subconsciously think about Indigenous people. So even though we love Indigenous people and culture, uh, we uh, may not be aware of how we have been socially conditioned to think of us as less than human or culturally deficient. So uh, yeah, Real Engine's a great documentary. Another one is more just around gender misrepresentation is another great documentary to start to unpack some of that and gain some awareness. And you know, uh, knowing our blind spots will really help us to understand our risk. Uh, and it can really help us to be proactive in reducing that risk to enhancing our own personal as resilience as well as community resilience and really help improve the disaster recovery pathways in BC. So with that, uh, really grateful to each of you, Kyanik Hajkam. Cook's Gem, Masicho, thank you all for uh, listening to my words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's always, uh, always so much learning takes place when you hold the space. So thank you for, for that wonderful presentation today. We're going to now ground the space of physical wellness, and I'm going to turn it over to Janine Erickson, and she's going to lead us in this space. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Stephanie. I found your presentation bang on like so many of the things in terms of um, uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the health system and, 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 and like you're talking about that culture shift. Um, I really appreciated your slides. Thanks for sharing that. Great. Hadi, my name is Janine Erickson. I am the Kazi Uten, which is a, a community in Northern BC. Um, I am honored to be adopted into the Takaya Wolf Clan FMHA family. And I'm um, really grateful to be here with you all in this kind of space. I'm talking uh, with you from the unceded territories, the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, Leewitis, and Musqueam people, um, also known by its uh, English name of Vancouver, BC. Um, my 
uh, role. Uh, I've been with the First Nations Health Authority for just over eight years, and I've um, been in um, partnership development and initiatives role within the CEO and CMO's offices. And um, I am currently on the board of directors of the newly amalgamated uh, BC College of Nurses and Midwives and um, as a public member and also sit on the inquiry committee for the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, um, and I've been passionate about uh, being involved in a number of our different initiatives um, within the FNHA, uh, particularly wellness, um, quality, and cultural safety and humility. I, I believe passionately um, in that connection between all of them in terms of addressing some of the anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare that we have um, have had, uh, but are, are are feeling this surge of um, addressing now. Um, grateful to be here and uh, just gonna take you through a couple of my slides, um, my acknowledgements. So I just wanted to share with you all uh, the BC First Nations perspective of health and wellness. Um, uh, worked from the First Nations Health Authority's approach uh, to health and wellness and um, just doing the caveat that this is um, this isn't something that necessarily belongs to us, but it has been developed from the teachings from our elders for thousands of generations, and um, it's a it's a reflection and depiction of wellness. Um, and I'll I'll walk you through a couple of different elements, but there's some important things to to know and remember um, when seeing this, you'll see uh, the human being in the middle, and that comes from um, Quetzalcoatl's teachings, um, Leonard George's teachings to us uh, in terms of it, it is fundamentally most important that you become the best human being that you can be, and understanding that everything is connected, everything is um, has a ripple effect. And so when there is... Um, a focus or an imbalance in one area, it'll have an imbalance in other areas. Um, looking at how the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual elements are um, beyond beyond that um, is similar to what you will see um, across different nations and across Turtle Island is um, the the four circles in terms of the, the medicine wheels. Um, and those elements and um, the community that, that you're connected to and holds it together. And what I really like about this piece is if you see on the outside um, of the circle, it kind of has these brushed strokes. So it's not, it's not uh, a solid picture. It's not like this is what wellness is. It's really important to understand that it's very difficult to be prescriptive in saying what wellness is because what that reflects back to me, it's, a, it's, a, it's meant to capture something that's fluid, something that's always moving. Our wellness is always um, moving during your um, stages of life. So uh, when you had no children to when you had children, your wellness fluctuates <laughs> to um, different seasons. Um, your wellness fluctuates from summer season to winter season. There's different fluctuations in that. And so it's just really recognizing that everything is connected and that when I look into this reflection and how my wellness reflects back to me is going to be different than how it reflects back for Emily or how it reflects back for Daryl or how it reflects back for Sequalia. And so it's, it's really important to understand that the way that this um, is captured is meant to reflect back for each individual what their wellness looks like at that time, at that period of time um, for what they're going through. And so um, I come from a pretty strong physical wellness base. Um, I've done a lot of running, uh, cycling, swimming, um, all kinds of things in my um, past. And um, I, I constantly feel that challenge where people think that when we're talking about wellness, um, that we're just talking about physical. Um, I really appreciate that the First Nations Health Authority, there is a, 
a, a, a large culture shift and acknowledgement of knowing that wellness actually means a more holistic view of wellness that incorporates that mental, spiritual, and emotional component, and that the physical outcomes that you see can have um, a direct link to um, an imbalance in any of those different areas. So we really encourage people to work on their wellness, but more than anything, um, looking at their reflection of wellness and what it looks like at that time, but encouraging people to go back. How's your wellness doing now? How's your wellness doing now? I liked how Stephanie was talking about how they were doing little learnings every single day um, for eight weeks. That's powerful. Look at how, look at the change that occurred in that period of time. And so just recognizing that, you know, wellness also needs to, it needs to embed into your, into the fabric of your work. It needs to embed into the fabric of your family wellness um, in order to have an impact, in order to, to shine brightly. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is uh, it's, it's, uh, it's listed up there as DC First Nations Perspective of Health and Wellness because it was um, developed uh, by our people for our people, but um, it's not something that is exclusive to our people. So a lot of people find that the holistic aspect and those pieces that we share um, in terms of our wellness resonates with other people. As First Nations people, we're not necessarily prescriptive and saying um, this is what it is. It's like if, if that resonates for you, you're welcome to, you know, apply it to your own wellness, to your family's wellness, to your own community's wellness. And so, um, but we, we put the specific uh, in terms of BC First Nations is just recognizing um, where it comes from and, and, and open to sharing with others. I uh, hope that makes sense. I'm going to go on to the next slide and just quickly review this. Um, the opening was talking about how your conference is talking about governance, which I thought was really interesting too. Um, and just understanding um, the ecosystem of health and wellness at the FNHA. And I kind of talk about this slide as like, this is how we roll. <laughs> um, but understanding that everything starts and ends with wellness in the center. Really, um, and, and really coming back to that. Um, constantly. And so um, then looking to that um, everybody, everybody owns their own health and wellness journey. So you see on the side that it starts with me. So understanding that every single community member, every single person um, owns their own health and wellness journey. And that's an aspect of the self-determination that in previous years has been ripped away from our people. And so really, um, at the forefront, establishing that, re-adjusting um, the powers of imbalance in terms of um, decision making, and knowing that the FNHA is a health and wellness partner to each individual family and community, um, and then knowing that our people can be health and wellness champions. We can be, you can be a health and wellness champion, and really looking at it like you, we've all kind of um, at some point in our lives probably made a plan for ourselves. Maybe it's um, a healthy eating plan, or maybe it's a physical activity plan. But have you ever made like a nurturing spirit plan? Like, have you ever, have you ever kind of gone, okay, for this next season, what does nurturing my spirit look like for me? And have you ever actually gone through the same kind of elements? for yourself to understand what you need to do? Have you looked at the relationships that you want to grow and develop? Have you reached out to some people that you haven't reached out to in a while? Um, it just, it causes you to take that focus and think about some of those things that, that you want to do so that just like training, just like um, getting to those end goals that you're looking for, um, it takes some intentional time to do that. So really looking at that decision-making framework in the top and seeing like me as an individual, I make a health and wellness plan for me. And then if I um, had a family, then I can um, look at, okay, what is the health and wellness plan for, for my family? What are, what are the things that we want to look at? And recently we just did a 30 by 30 at FNHA. It was active 30 by 30. So just encouraging people to do 30 minutes of activity for 30 days in September. So um, get outside, go for a walk, and, and um, you know, if you get a family outside, usually once you get going, you can't reel them back in, which is great. You know, it's just about um, creating some of those opportunities to do that. Um, and then as a community, being able to say if you had, say, 17 families in your community, 
uh, what would your community health and wellness plan look like? And then rolling it up to the nation, sub-regional level, and the regional level, and the provincial level, you can see how you can um, roll up our up to our regional health and wellness plans that we have at the FNHA, which has been the first time um, we can directly say from the people, uh, mental health and wellness is the number one priority in every region of the province. And so um, looking towards our vision, um, our overall vision for healthy, self-determining and vibrant DC First Nations children, family and communities, uh, working with our, our partnership so with the health system, you can see us in the same boat and we're going in the same direction, right? So if this is the decision-making framework and this is the governance and the engagement that our people, our direction has been given to us as the First Nations Health Authority, if you're partnering with the First Nations Health Authority, wanting to partner with our communities, then this is the same thing that is also um, over to you. Um, looking at transforming the system uh, with cultural humility, uh, walking that path to transform health and wellness services, so um, we noticed with a lot of our conversations with the health system, there would be this understanding of like, oh, okay, that's nice. That's a pretty picture. You know, our perspective of health and wellness, that's nice. That's for the well people and not really understanding that, no, 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 we, we're talking about health and wellness in all things, not just, not just well things or not just physically fit things or not just like once you're there, you're well. We were talking about health and wellness. Um, woven into every single thing you do um, because even um, in crisis and emergency management that you all are a part of, even in end of life, there are well ways in which to do these things um, that um, can reduce harm um, moving forward. And so also looking at, you can see the Western um, and the traditional medicine um, symbols on both sides and looking to bring the best of both worlds together to create, to transform the system from the, the sickness system that it is to the health and wellness system that we're looking for it to be so that it can be culturally safe for our people and all people. I don't have enough time to get into like a lot more of those, but just kind of hopefully that kind of gives you some um, high level uh, building blocks of, of kind of how we roll over here at the FNHA. I was asked to do a movement moment. I expect some of you guys to get a move. So I'm gonna roll the shoulder. Stretch, thank you everybody. That was a little bit everywhere. I hope you feel better. That was amazing. And every you should see the chat. People are like loving the chats for movement. Thank you so much. Oh man, Janine, that totally filled us all up. I have to extend so much gratitude to you because I know that um, when you do these sessions and you bring your physical self, you bring your whole physical self and I've seen you move a whole room of booties. So uh, the work that you do is just so instrumental and grounded in wellness. And um, I'm just so thankful for the energy uplift there. Um, now, Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Moving from kind of the physical space to the cultural and spiritual space, I'm so thankful for uh, Levi and Jody to be able to join us from Selton Leyland today. Um, this is a wellness service that as a practitioner of emergency management has kind of met me in some of those darkest spaces. And I am so eternally grateful for the support um, and wellness um, and healing that I've received from South and Lalem. And so my hope is that um, this glimpse of healing and wellness can be shared with everybody on the call today. Because I can tell you from um, moving from a non-Indigenous space of work to an Indigenous space of work with FNHA, I didn't have access to these types of services in my day-to-day -day work in emergency management. And so to now have this space of connection to wellness and cultural wellness has been um, absolutely instrumental to how I ground myself in my work. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jody and Levi. Thank you for the introduction, Emily. And thank you for that, Janine. That was a lot of fun. Um, my name is Malakria. Uh, on my maternal side of my family, and my, on my paternal side of my family, I'm known as to say it's that my English name is Jody, 
and uh, I come from Halop First Nation, which is on Vancouver Island, uh, just north of Cowichan. Um, <clears throat> I'm calling, I'm dialed in today from the unceded territory of the Sinanawas Nation. Um, I'm currently the coordinator for the Resolution Health Support Worker Program, which means I oversee uh, five RHSWs and our cultural and elder support team. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, our team uh, is fortunate enough that we get to travel out throughout Vancouver Island and sometimes throughout BC uh, as a combination of RHSWs and elder and cultural support where we respond to crisis and trauma calls as well as health and wellness. Um, our teams will go out and uh, we provide uh, brushings and emotional support uh, to communities in crisis. Um, the most recent was the flooding from uh, Rivers, Rivers Inlet. Um, we, we, we spend a lot of time on the road and, you know, I feel before I was placed in this position as the coordinator, I was in RHSW and in the short time that I've been here, I've learned a lot from the elders that we travel with, you know, Levi Martin is here with us today and he is one of the, the elders that, that leads the process when we go into community and uh, by cedar brushing and by using uh, various forms of medicine with the people that we encounter and to see people who are completely fatigued and um, just not in a good space uh, when they arrive to meet our team and then to see the transformation for the individuals after they've received the help from our cultural support it's just phenomenal and you know i feel so honored to be able to be a part of that process and to be learning each and every day from the elders that not only i coordinate but i work alongside with um, and so that being said i'm going to pass the pass the uh, floor over to levi and uh, he'll share his some of his culture and his teachings with us. Aloha. But anyway, okay. Like you know, ever since I was like when I was a little kid, my my father taught me a prayer. When I first wake up, the very first thing I do, I say this prayer, and it says. Donna's ear besides how with Miss Howell. I say that prayer four times. Tana's ear besides how with Miss Howell. Tana's ear besides how with Miss Howell. Tana's ear besides how with Miss Howell. And that prayer says, Let all good things just naturally drift towards me. After I've said that prayer four times, then I open myself to receive the gifts that I need just for today so that I can do things in a good way. After I said that prayer and open myself to receive the gifts and I go and I acknowledge the, the sacred elements that sustain life to every living thing in this, in this world of ours. Sacred elements are fire, water, air, mother earth. So again, this is a teaching from my father that, you know, that I go out, I open the door, I take four breaths of air, and I take, I say thank you to the air for sustaining my life and the life of every living thing in this world. And I go back and in, get a glass of water, and I say thank you to the water for sustaining my life and every living thing in this world. And I take four sips of water and I say thank you for giving me the good energy and keeping, you know, sustaining life to every living thing. Then, then I, I have something from Mother Earth. Something from Mother Earth is like, Usually, I, I wake up early. That was one of my, again, my father's teaching to wake up early. Four o'clock in the morning, I wake up. And I, do, I go through my, my little ceremonies, my rituals. And 
The third thing is like a, from Mother Earth. I have something from Mother Earth. And I usually have a cup of coffee and maybe a slice of toast. And I say thank you to Mother Earth for sustaining my life and everything, like all living things. And I say thank you to Mother Earth for providing us with everything that we need in our lives. And when the fire comes up, and the sun comes up, put my hand out, and I say thank you to the fire sustaining my life and every living thing in this world. So those are the four sacred elements. And as powerful as these elements are, not one of them can sustain life by itself. What connects these sacred elements, what connects them so that they can like, you know, work together is the spirit. So I also acknowledge the spirit and say thank you to the spirit, like, you know, for, for the connection that we have to all living things, to everything in this world, in the universe. In our language, we say, everything is one and everything is connected. So, then, <clears throat> then when I'm ready to go out, there's a I take something from Mother Earth, a plant, like, you know, and I put it in my mouth and I chew on it. I chew on it because the elders have said to us, like, you know, the crown that we walk on, it's made up from the dust of our ancestors. And everything that grows from the, from the dust of our ancestors is very sacred. So I take a plant and I take it and I put it in my mouth and I chew on it. So when I'm chewing on it, swallowing my, like, you know, the saliva, I'm swallowing the knowledge and the wisdom of our ancestors. And also, like, you know, that wherever I go, whatever I say, that I will speak with honor. Speaking with honor means speaking without offending, with humility. And I also like you know ask that I will listen with honor. Listening with honor means to be able to listen without being offended. So when you're not offended, there's like you no know, no reason to be upset about anything. And, and the last thing that you know the the ancestors the elders have said to me was like, you know, that, well, it's not the last thing, but one of the other things that they've said to me, like, you know, that was our, our role and responsibility in his life is to be the best that we can be without being better than anyone else. So like in, these are the teachings and like one of the things that are not, again, not one of the things, but these are the things that I live by, the teachings of our ancestors. And, and as I go out and meet the people, connect with the people, connect with everything, like, you know, whether it be animals or birds or whatever, like, you know. And I always remember that the elders, I've said, like, you know, being healthy, living healthy is contagious. So wherever you go, when you do these things, live with the, live with the environment and have all the, like, the sacred elements. Like, you know, when I do these sacred elements, the ceremony with the sacred elements, like, I mean, I call it fueling up for the day. So that I'll have the strength and courage to do the things that I need to do in a good way. True, I guess that's all I'm going to share for now. True, thank you.
Thank you so much, Levi. It's always so grounding to have um, I Sout and Lalem um, guide our work with culture, ground our work in the space and provide that wraparound support to community and to practitioners that are doing the hard work in their communities and for their organizations. So thank you so much. Um, with that said now, um, we've heard from all of our speakers, we've seen a lot of dialogue on the Zoom and webinar um, and web series chats and so much gratitude going around the circle, wrapping around from the space of uh, cultural and spiritual wellness to the space of physical wellness and then to that space of how we can apply all of these learnings and all of these lessons within our space of practice and the space that we hold within both of our um, our communities on a personal level and our communities from a space of professional practice. We do have one um, piece that we were going to bring um, kind of the collective wisdom of everybody that's joined us in this session today. Um, and Susanna, I'm, uh, as you know, I've been working with Susanna, who is helping, uh, helping to uh, organize and lead these sessions on behalf of understanding risk. And we wanted to have a word cloud today, very similar to the way that Stephanie um, brought those spaces of intention, um, where there was that contribution of um, how, how people um, saw their space of wellness. And so we really want to ask you today, um, what are your reflections from today's session? What is it that you're taking away with you? And what are the words and um, your own spaces of wellness that you can leave others that have joined the session today? We're definitely seeing uh, this extension of gratitude in the space of grounding. Um, I think the space of holistic and wellness really resonates um, and a space of engagement and an engaging dialogue. Um, as well as that inspiring space of dialogue. And I think this is a profound reflection of how we've brought ourselves as a space of collective energy into this conversation today, um, and then how the panel has brought themselves to, uh, to today's space to be able to share so openly and to be able to bring the gifts that they hold within their space of practice with everyone today. Um, and so I am just profoundly grateful for um, the fact that uh, this panel had the courage to join me today and to really share their gifts. And I hope that each of you as practitioners in your work feel a sense of being wrapped around today. So wrapped around with that blanket um, in terms of being grounded in the space of wellness and maybe being in that space of collective action and energy today. And I feel like that's what I'm seeing from this word cloud. So I have deep gratitude to everybody today for joining. I'm gonna turn it over to Susanna so she can uh, go over some next steps. And then to end the session today, we'll uh, have Sequalia close us out. So Susanna, what are those next steps? And then Susanna, I'll leave it to you to turn it over to Sequalia to uh, close the session for us today. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I also have a lot of gratitude for all of you for sharing um, all the pieces you did. I feel like we had such a lovely hitting at it from all the different ways of thinking about how do we achieve wellness and how do we cultivate our humanity as we work together. And thank you all so much. I'm taking away a lot with myself. I want to let you know that because we're meeting virtually, in lieu of a speaker's gift this year, URBC, Understanding Risk BC, is giving a $400 donation to Preparing Our Home, which is a Canadian community-based resilience planning program for Indigenous youth to support them to reach their potential in becoming emergency preparedness leaders in their communities. And uh, we're so pleased to be able to support this really interesting and important project. Thank you so much for your time today. And I'd like to please uh, pass it over to Sequalia to, uh, to close us off for today. I just want to say, um, Chen Quinman told me, I'm grateful and thankful to each and every one of you for your presentations and the sharing that you had with all of us. And I know that from seeing some of the comments in the chat box that others felt the same way and they get got something in resonated with them and that they um, will always remember that. And I always like to share that my grandmother told me, um, I asked her for a legend one day and my son, late son was a baby. And she said, 
kind of looked at me and she went, do you know that um, legends aren't like Aesop's fables or Grimm's fairy tales? That they're actually about our real family and people. And um, these things happened. And maybe others who don't know us think it's just a fairy tale, but they're real. So I want to put my hands up to each and every one of you because I believe today we've created the legend of being here and understanding and sharing the resiliency that was shared by all of the presenters and all of you by joining in. So be witness to that, that you were part of this legend today. And then I wanted to say thank you because we need, you know, Chen Kuen Men told me means I'm grateful and thankful to you. And um, in Squamish language that you shared about, you know, being able to take care of your mental, emotional, physical, spiritual well-being and being able to in the times of emergencies, like with the pandemic or with the flooding or things that happen in community, the fires, that's when you have to center yourself and be connected to, as um, Levi said, all the elements and be able to pray, creator, the ancestor, mother earth, the water, air and fire to um, be able to just take a breath and pray and know that you can um, adapt to that situation and make the changes that need to be changed to help the people that are being impacted. And right now, that's what I find is a lot of our young people are coming back to knowing that we need to go out to the mountains and go for that shukam, that bath in the water and brush off the negative and anxiety and depression by going in the cold water and doing the dunks and using the cedar branches to brush off and asking first though the tree to pity you, the cedar tree to pity you and help you by allowing you to take a few little branches you don't need big branches, just little branches and go in the water and ask the water to pity you as you start to brush off and break the water. And then when you finish your dunks, throw it in or in the ocean. And, you know, young people are starting to do it again and remembering and it's helping them have that inner, you know, resiliency to be facing the last six to eight months that we've been going through COVID. And it will help them because they always say the old people in your left hand closest to your heart is your culture, language, and traditions and practices. In this hand is your education, your jobs, and your daily life you have to do to make it in this world that you need to have that money and that job. But when you're having stress, it's this, the culture and traditions that's going to carry you and help you. So I just um, had to share those words because you all kind of like, as I listened, and I thank Janine for getting me up and moving. Although I couldn't, um, don't have a table in here to climb on. <laughs> so I could have got on my bed and jumped up and down like a trampoline. No, I'm in my bedroom. So <laughs> this is my office that you see. And, um, you know, help me because I was um, doing some exercises earlier and my 16 year old grandson was like, can you pass my pop down? And he came from school and then he went, oh, never mind. And I said, well, you know, I'm getting old, need to stretch my uh, muscles and that. And he was like, yeah, well, I've got a pain too from playing basketball. <laughs> so, you know, taking care of ourselves, that's what our elders did. And they kept mobile, you know, my grandfather, he was like close to probably um, 100, 
And up until probably a month before he passed, he was still pushing the wheelbarrow down to the river to go gather the herbs and medicines and other odds and ends that he found down there. And, you know, people say, oh, you should help him. And they said, he doesn't want our help. And that's what kept his heart going. And they believe that doing those things of going to the water gets your heart going. So I'm going to um, just ask us to come together again and do um, Snowbird Song and say a prayer and close us off. And thank you for sharing. Let me share part of the day with you. So just get centered and be ready to finish our day together. Asking you, Creator, watch over and guide and protect each of your children gathered here today. Put a shield around them and their families and their friends. With the, and help them with their squall and their feelings in their heart, their mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health and well-being. Help to guide them and help them in the work that they do every day. And Creator, help them to keep learning how to take care of themselves because people forget to do that so that they can keep helping others. Asking you, Creator, to hear our prayers for all our family and friends who have serious illnesses and injuries that are waiting for treatments or surgeries. Prayers for all of their health, healing, and recovery. Creator, hear our prayers for all our family and friends who have traumas and are battling alcohol and drugs because of that trauma especially in this time of the fentanyl, carfentanyl opioid crisis that is taking lives daily. And for those incarcerated who may be getting released to be careful because um, the supply has gotten stronger since they last used it. So prayers for them to find the healing path to recovery and prayers for their family and friends to worry about them because they don't want to lose them and will, are always praying they find that healing path to recovery. Asking you, Creator, to hear our prayers for all our family and friends who may have lost loved ones who have am squalling strong feelings of sorrow and grief to know the pain never leaves it changes so that we remember our loved ones with the love and happiness and memories we have in our hearts and minds and that's how we keep them with us with all of that and to know that they always watch over us and send us those spiritual signs maybe a dragonfly i heard they have two sets of wings because they have angels on their back or a ladybug is an angel come to visit you or hummingbird eagle wolf even now grizzly bears maybe those are a sign when they you're in a low place and they make you lift up and feel lighter and smile that's your loved ones helping you spiritually so creator help each and every one of your children again and I ask you to help them with Chayap Yo, help them all to take care. Tama Quitsi Snatchim, those are my words. Chen Quen Mintomi. 
I'm grateful and thankful to all of you for allowing me to share this part of your day. And thank you for sharing with me all and adding to what I know. Wachayapyo, you all take care. Oh. Goodbye. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Check out Sarah Hang Hart's did a graphic recording for us. Thank you so much. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, check that out as you're on your way out. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Sarah, that's so cool. I Thank love you. that. It's awesome. It won all. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom. It's such a wonderful session.